Welcome back to ProSportsFix.com. I'm Matt the Hitman Hoover. I am, of course, joined by the Big Mac, Matt Caruso. On the line, a very special guest, a former NFL player for three teams, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Kansas City Chiefs, and, of course, the New England Patriots, but very briefly, John Wellborn. John, welcome to Pro Sports Fix. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, the first question I have for you, uh, were you a football fan growing up? <clears throat> no, not a huge football fan. I didn't really understand the game until I got a little older. I uh, didn't really watch it a ton when I was a kid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, what for what for sports did you watch, if any, as a kid? Um, I was always a huge boxing fan, and I liked to watch basketball. So, awesome. Yeah, I, I had uh, visions of, uh, of being a, a boxer, and I always thought that would have been a a pretty good trade-off instead of playing football. Uh, Matt? Uh, uh, what sports did you play growing up, John? Um, I started in martial arts when I was probably about five years old, about the same time I started in soccer and basketball. So I played soccer and baseball and basketball until I was probably middle school and then got into primarily just uh, doing some boxing stuff and then also – um, playing basketball and hoops, and then I decided to play football in high school and uh, did football on track and lifted weights and then got a scholarship and went on, and that was kind of the end of it. So I, uh, uh, you know, from a young age, I just always kind of uh, appreciated the combat sports and, you know, being the youngest of three brothers, I was always pretty decent with my hands, so it just seemed like a natural progression. Uh, what positions uh, did you play in uh, high school football? I played uh, defensive tackle and guard. Which side did you prefer uh, more, offense or defense? Uh, I always liked offense. Um, I always, uh, I'm, I'm really good with a plan. I, I like the idea of like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Let's lay it out. Let's go in this direction. Defense seemed a little too uh, on the fly, a little too spontaneous. You know, there was, you know, just a little basic. So I always appreciated the strategic nature of playing on offense. Absolutely, Matt. Which NFL team was your favorite growing up? Uh, oddly enough, uh, my dad got us season tickets to the Raider games. Um, geez, when the Raiders were in L.A. and my brothers and I used to go to the Raider games. So we, we had uh, season tickets, um, you know, the cheap seats. And I remember sitting up there with, uh, you know, the melting pot that was the L.A. Raiders. I mean, I remember we uh, sat in the section with um, – uh, a pretty aggressive Mexican gang, and uh, they were, you know, we saw them every week, and they were always pretty cool with us. And I watched the, pretty much the uh, the toughest people in L.A. come to that game and beat the hell, living hell out of anybody else that showed up. So it was uh, definitely pretty aggressive and pretty eye-opening as a, uh, you know, kid in middle school. To, you know, my dad got us tickets, so my brothers and I went, and we definitely got to see some stuff at the L.A. Raider games. Are you um, surprised there's no uh, LA team there today? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a big mistake by the NFL to not have a team here. Um, I just think it's, uh, you know, not real sharp on their part. But I mean, obviously, it's not hurting them. The NFL, I'm sure, is not going to go out of business anytime soon. I mean, they definitely strategically weave themselves in as America's game and. You know, it doesn't seem to be hurting them. They don't have an L.A. franchise. And I think at this point, they could not add another franchise. I think it's pretty balanced at 16 teams, and 32 is a good number. I think any more teams, and they start diluting the talent pool. So they, they're going to have to get somebody to move. But, you know, teams real or uh, cities realize that these are huge revenue makers, and, you know, people have a lot uh, allegiance and loyalty to the team, and it's tough to move a team. Sure. John, uh, when you were in high school, which colleges were recruiting you at the time? Uh, I think I got close to 100 scholarship offers. And oh, wow. uh, schools I took trip to, or I, I took recruiting trips that I was pretty active in were uh, Colorado, uh, UCLA, USC, uh, Berkeley, and Nebraska. Uh, I'm just curious, as a Penn State fan, did Penn State recruit you? No, I did not get uh, any contact from Penn State. Okay. Um, wh why did you end up picking a uh, Cal? Um, at the time, you know, Cal is kind of an interesting place in that, uh, you know, in terms of academics, there really are just only a few schools in the world in the country that really uh, 
can compete with Cal academically. And when I looked at it, uh, you know, it probably came down to USC or UCLA in terms of what degree I wanted to hang on the wall. And coming from LA, uh, I thought it would have been a nice change to actually go away to college and go up uh, to Berkeley. And at the time, uh, we had a pretty good offensive line coach and a guy named Tom Cable, who was the you know head coach for the Raiders. And sure. also, uh, you know, he, he was 28 years old and he was my offensive line coach. And Todd Stucey and Eric Malum and a lot of guys had you know were he had coached had gone off and played in the NFL. Uh, Tark Glenn, Jeremy Newberry, I mean, all these guys that I played with. So it was interesting to see how many offensive linemen and even defensive linemen, linemen with Reagan Upshaw and Dwayne Clemens and a lot of these guys uh, got to go play in the NFL and were high draft picks. So I figured, uh, you know, if you want to play at a high level, you got to go work with the best. And you know, he seemed to be at the time. Uh, pretty good offensive line coach, and I liked the school, and I was happy to hang the degree on my wall, so it was kind of a natural fit. What positions did you play in college? Was it guard or, or tackle or both? So they, when I came in, they had me play tackle, and then um, my second year I played guard, and my third year I uh, I started the whole season at guard. And then my fourth year and my fifth year, they moved me to left tackle. Okay. Matt? Uh, your memories of playing at Cal? Yeah. Yeah. I remember, uh, you know, oddly enough, my wife and I talked about this the other day, is she started asking me about specific games, and I really only remember the games that we lost. And unfortunately, we lost a lot of games at Cal. I think we were like five and six, or six and six, and three and eight, and four and seven. So we had a lot of losses. And oddly enough, I remember more of the losses than the wins. So I do remember quite a few of the games. What was the NFL Combine experience like? Were you surprised? You know, that the, I mean, you just got done t- talking about all these great names of being coached by Tom Cable. But were you surprised when the NFL showed interest and you got to go to the Combine and go through that whole process? Um, you know, going to play in the NFL wasn't necessarily something that I, uh, you know, had a vision of from the time I was a young kid. Um, I just knew there were a lot of really good players at Cal, and I knew that if I could get a chance to go there, um, I was just more stoked about getting a scholarship, getting a free education. So the way I looked at it is I didn't really know anybody that played in the NFL. I didn't really even know anybody that played college football. So I, here's this opportunity to get all my school paid for. I get to go, go to one of the best universities in the world, and they're going to pay me to do it. So I went to Berkeley, and then what was interesting is I think my rookie year I was playing on the scout team, and I'm playing against a guy named Reagan Upshaw, and I remember – uh, you know, battling out and playing, and I remember you know him beating me, and uh, you know me being able to hold my own, and then I go into my second year, and after my second year, he leaves early and is like a top ten draft pick, and Dwayne Clemens was another guy I played against, and those guys were top ten draft picks, and then you know the way it kind of works is as you're growing up and as you're playing as a young guy, you're playing against guys who are older. And all of a sudden, you know, these guys leave and they go in their first round draft picks and then you're watching them in the NFL and these guys are dominating in the NFL and you start kind of making the, the jump and saying, well, geez, uh, if, I, if I was pretty competitive with these guys and these guys are able to do it, I should be able to do it too. So that was kind of my uh, natural thought process is after having played with a lot of guys that were very successful in the NFL, realizing that I had an opportunity to go do it. Absolutely. Matt? Did you have any role models getting into the NFL? Um, role models. Oh, you mean like players that I watched that I kind of emulated? Sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there there were guys that I really liked the way they played. I liked the way that they did things. I liked their, you know, the position and their, you know, position and posture and the way that they played. And I remember watching guys on tape and thinking, wow, they, they have a certain skill set, and if I can develop that skill set, I'll be successful. And I remember, um, uh, you know, seeing Dan Neal and uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name who played at Washington. Uh, oh, jeez, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um, he was a guard that played for the, the Redskins and was a, a real good player. And I remember watching him on film, and I really liked how he bent his knees and how he played real low, and so I just tried to emulate that. And then, um, you know, just seeing the tenacity of which guys played, you know, so I was pretty fortunate to, you know, as a young guy in the NFL, nobody's really going to hand you much, or at least I didn't get handed much. So it was kind of a deal where I had to watch on film and try to make changes 
and you know hopefully develop my own technique because I knew uh, you know every player is very unique and uh, unfortunately I wasn't six eight and I wasn't four hundred pounds and you know <laughs> I was like a little smaller more athletic I know it sounds funny but there definitely needed to be a, a, a skill set for me and my rookie year I came in and I played tackle ended up getting hurt and that off season they brought in John Runyon and played him a whole double money. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, I go from being a starter to being a backup. And then I, um, you know, uh, we had a guy inside that wasn't playing that well. And then they moved me into guard. And thank God they did because really that was my natural position. I was always a much better guard. It just so happened, though, that I had the skill to play tackle. So a lot of teams, like when I went to Kansas City, they wanted me to play tackle when I was like, dude, leave me inside. I'm a much more valuable player. But, you know, they're the ones writing the checks. So they're the ones that make the decisions. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, you, you talked about, you know, coming into the league. Do you think that was one of, like, the the things a lot of teams liked about you was your versatility that you could play guard and tackle, even though you were more, you know, uh, comfortable at guard? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, anytime you can bring in, a, you know, a young guy who is, you know, plays hard, you know, is willing to, you know, work hard and lift weights and train and, you know, comes from a decent school that, uh, you know, hopefully you should be able to learn the playbook. Uh, you know, it's always a plus plus. So I know um, it was kind of interesting on draft day. I had a bunch of teams call me before the draft and say, hey, we're going to take you with a second round pick. We're going to take you with a third round pick. And so I figured I'd be a first day guy. And then when that, that didn't happen, I ended up getting drafted, I think, the second pick on the second day. So I was the second pick in the fourth round. And I remember the phone rang at like 6.05 or 6.10 in the morning. And I remember I was like, didn't even get up because I was so pissed about not getting drafted on the first day, you know. Absolutely. Um, I, I have to say, and this is just me as a fan of yours, I remember watching those Eagles, and you were definitely a big uh, a big improvement over Doug Brzezinski at the time, so uh, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Um, you mentioned some of the teams on draft day that showed interest in you, and it just for whatever reason, uh, it, it didn't uh, work out. During that draft process, which team showed the most interest? Um, the Jets are really looking for a guard. Um, you think the Jets and the Raiders. Um, I, I had always kind of secretly hoped to, to one day to play for the Raiders, um, and it never really worked out. I was, I thought after my last year in Kansas City, I was like, man, I'm ready to go to the Raiders. And uh, even though Tom Cable's there, they never called me, so I was pretty bummed about that. But uh, I, as I remember, it was the Jets, and I remember about three or four teams had a real needed guard, and they, um, you know, the Eagles had come and worked me out, and I hadn't heard a single thing from them. Then all of a sudden, I, I get a phone call that morning. I wake up, and, hey, we drafted you, and I turn on the TV, and I see my name click across with uh, with the Eagles. And I kind of was laughing a little bit because uh, I didn't think their offensive lineman or offensive line coach liked me very much after the workout because, uh, it was you know, I, I, you know, he was holding a bag. And I remember I, like, after about 45 minutes to about an hour and a half of, of working out, I kept hitting the bag and knocking him over. And after I knocked him over about the 10th time, he, he stopped the workout. And I remember thinking, there's no way they were going to draft me. I, I was taking cheap shots in the bag and knocking the cough or the uh, the coach over. I have to ask you now, coming coming off of that, obviously Wonka still was that coach. Being you know coming from that experience and then working with the guy for the next couple of years, um, did he ever mention you know, mention that to you? Hey, you know when I worked you out, you kind of took some shots, or uh, didn't he ever say anything? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean he, um, uh, you know, yeah, he definitely. I, I think he liked it. You know, Juan always liked that I was kind of a hard player, and the fact that I was you know, not letting up and taking it easy. I think he liked that. And, uh, you know, he liked the fact, like, I think he went out and trained a lot of guys or put a lot of guys through workouts and they would tap out and say, no, I'm not doing this. This is too much after, you know, because mo most of the individual workouts you do with the coach for, you know, 20 minutes and the dude just kept coming. And, you know, my deal is I always try to put my best foot forward. And, you know, if, if the guy is, you know, there for a job interview, I'm going to work as hard as he wants. And that was just kind of a little bit different kind of mentality. And, I'm, you know, I think a lot of guys get to the point where they're going to the draft and they kind of become prima donnas. And I, um, you know, at that point, I wasn't necessarily a prima donna. So that didn't happen until later in my life. I got to ask you one more question, and I got a lot of questions to ask you. I'm just very excited uh, during the interview. Um, when you heard that Juan Castillo was made the Eagles defensive coordinator, you were obviously a former player of his. Were you at all surprised, and, and how did you think he would handle it? No, I wasn't surprised at all. Um, I was surprised that he got the 
opportunity to be a defensive coordinator. I mean, Juan was a linebacker and actually started as a defensive uh, graduate assistant and really worked on the defensive side of the ball. It wasn't until he was working at the Eagles with uh, Tom Callahan and um, uh, oh god, uh, the guy on Monday Night Football is John Gruden. Yeah, John Gruden. Um, you know that they put him on as uh, the offensive side of the ball. So. Um, the one thing I'll say about Juan Castillo is I've never in my life seen anybody work harder than him. Um, that guy, if the job took, you know, 24 hours a day, he was going to put in 24 hours a day. I've never in my life seen anybody work uh, that type of deal, and he um, he definitely outworked people. And so when I saw him get the opportunity, I one I was glad for him to get the opportunity because I knew he would, uh, you know had the ferocity and the, uh, you know, the passion to make it happen. And, you know, he's not lazy. So I was like, dude, you know, I sat in meetings with that guy. That guy knows offense is better than anybody out there. And if there's somebody that knows something, he's calling him on the phone. So I don't think the job is over his head. I think putting him in that situation uh, at the time in the, in the kind of, let me say, the tumultuous situation the Eagles were in, I think he was kind of a scapegoat. And unfortunately, he was kind of the scapegoat for a lot of their, their woes. Absolutely, I have to I have to agree with that for sure. It's the proof's in the pudding because the Eagles' defense got a lot worse after he got fired. So yeah, I mean um, it, it's kind of a strange deal, you know. Um, uh, you know, the NFL is so much about chemistry, and I think coaches and teams uh, really, or I mean, coaches in front office, and uh, they really overlook it. But as a player, I've played on teams where you walked into the situation. And you knew there wasn't a snowball's telling chance that you were going to lose that game. And if by some off chance somebody was going to beat you, you know, beat you, you like walk away and be like, "Wow, I didn't see that one coming. They must have done something fantastic to beat us." And I've also played on teams where it was the exact opposite, where we went into it and guys were thinking to themselves, "There's no way we're going to win this game." And it was so amazing to play in a on a team like the Eagles where I had no doubt every day we were walking in to any stadium, anywhere in the world, anywhere, any stadium, didn't matter who I was playing against, I knew we were going to win that game. And if by some chance we didn't, you know what, they just happened to get us that day. Whereas playing in Kansas City, it was almost the exact opposite mentality. And it was, I, I don't understand, it's all about vision and culture in the NFL, but I don't know how you, you can go in and change a culture the way you do, and so it, it's always been fascinating to me, and I've, I've, I've replayed it a hundred times in my head, but it's uh, it's definitely pretty fascinating. It's got to be frustrating as a fan, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, Matt? You joined the Eagles around the same time McNabb did. What was your first impression of McNabb? Uh, Donovan and I were drafted the same year. Um, I always liked Donovan. Uh, you know, um, I, I thought he had a set of skills that were pretty good. And as long as he stayed into his, in his wheelhouse and stayed with what he was good with, I think he was fine. I think when you start kind of stressing him a little bit and putting him outside of his comfort zone, I think where we ran into some problems and, uh, you know, injuries and, you know, I think never really feeling like the city really wanted him, I think was always hard on him. And, um, you know, I think there was a, a certain expectation put on him, and when he didn't meet it, they still kind of matched him a little bit. So um, I always liked Donovan. I always got along really well with him. Um, you know, I, you know, we had the right offensive line. We had a good running game. We had some good receivers, and we had a defense that was could make some plays. And, uh, you know, a defense coordinator like Jim Johnson that would, uh, you know, blitz people and could gamble and really take, you know, take big plays away from people. So it was just a matter of being consistent and, uh you know, it, uh, I'm, I'm sad that we didn't get a chance to to win the big game, but, you know, we had some great teams now. Absolutely. Matt? Did uh, McNabb change through the years? You know, just like his, like, attitude, his persona type thing, as he kind of blew up, you know, went from a top draft pick to all of a sudden people are in Philly and around the league are saying, oh, wow, he's one of the best quarterbacks. You know, did that go to his head at all? Um, I don't know. You know, I I wouldn't necessarily say that Donovan necessarily changed who he was. I just think that, you know, with much is given, much is expected. And I think when you put together a pretty good team that has a pretty good run game and some good receivers and, you know, good tight end that does some things and, you know, you got a, you know, special teams guys that run downfield, 
it becomes the you know the sum of the parts end up making a successful team. And I think is as those parts and those coaches and those players started kind of getting away and leaving, um, I think it started putting a lot more pressure on Donovan. And I think you know the big contract and all that really kind of put a ton of pressure on him. And um, you know the major thing in the NFL is if you are not making moves to get better, then it, technically you're getting worse. And I'm not saying he was complacent or whatnot, but I just know that every year I looked at it like I got to go out and I got to train harder and I got to be better than I was the year before, or you know because the status quo is getting worse. So I, the the only thing that I really ever noticed was. Um, you know, he had a great skill set, and, but, you know, that's not good enough. you got to get better each year, and that was, I think, where we really lacked is that we weren't, you know, we, we had some great great success, and we, were, we had an upward spot or uh, an upward ascent, and then I think things kind of trailed off a little bit, and I think uh, the team and, you know, a lot of the players kind of rested on what they'd done in the past, that there was a certain aura of mystique, and it doesn't work like that. For sure. Obviously, you played for Andy Reid coming in. Uh, he was obviously looking to change the culture like you talked about earlier. Uh, we've heard stories about like his first training camp in 99, you know, the horror stories. Um, what was that training camp like for you as a player, and uh, is there any stories that, that you could share with us? Well, training camp was six weeks long because we had a bye week in training camp, and uh, we had double-day practices just about every single day. We were staying in, uh, you know, Lehigh, Pennsylvania, uh, at Lehigh University in these, you know, dorms that were probably, you know, housed soldier, soldiers during the Civil War. You know, no no <laughs> air conditioning, no heat. I mean, it, it, it was pretty uh, Spartan, to say the least. And, uh, you know, it was hot. I mean, anybody that's, you know, lived in Philly in the summer and, you know, you know thunder and rain, and it was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I always remember I read a biography by, um, uh, I think it was uh, Benjamin Franklin, and he was talking about, you know, the mosquitoes and the heat and, uh, you know the the you know the uh, 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 you know the humidity and then how crappy like Philadelphia was this hellhole and I remember being there and like really remember like knowing what he was talking about as we were in training camp in Lehigh and uh, that was definitely um, a training camp for the ages I mean uh, you know that was you know really my first indoctrination this was my first experience in the NFL and it was interesting laughing now looking at training camp the way it is now, I'm like, man, I could have played for 20 years of, at this rate. One question. Um, one story that we hear a lot is about George Hegeman being, you know, he's being asked to push the sled up and down the practice field, and then the next day they cut him. Um, first off, was that true? And, uh, you know, what was what exactly went on, you know, where, where a player can be on the practice field busting his butt, and then the next day he's being released? <laughs> So what happened was uh, George was a um, one of the biggest human beings we've ever seen. I mean, he was probably about six eight, like three hundred and sixty. You know, di- you know, a dieted down three hundred, probably heavy when he was three six five, three eighty. Probably dieted down to three thirty five, and was a huge, huge man and played down in Dallas. They bring him in as a high price free agent, and they got him there. And uh, that training camp. Towards the end of training camp, they put Doug Brzezinski in front of him as the starter. And when George found out, he got pissed and he left and didn't show up to practice. So guys called him on the phone. And they were like, dude, you can't do this. you got to come back. And so he came back, and Andy Reid punished him by uh, making him go out there and drive the sled around and had a little you know, punishment session. And then when he walked off the field, cut him. Oh, man. What does that do to the locker room, you know, seeing that, how everything transpired? Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> I think, you know, uh, at the time, I mean, I thought it was pretty cold-blooded, but, you know, you look back on it and you can ask anybody that's, you know, ever run a business, the best way to, to shake up your employees and your staff is just to randomly fire somebody whether or not they deserve it or not. And I think it had a lot of guys looking over their shoulder. I mean, a lot of guys, like, realized that this guy wasn't playing around if if he was going to, you know, cut some high price veteran and the guy that kind of, you know, fucked up a little bit. I mean, the part of my language, but I mean, it was, uh, I think it was very calculated. Um, you know, I don't think that they saw George as a guy that was, you know, big in their future and he gave them a great opportunity to do something. And, you know, they whacked him in a very creative, creative kind of cold blooded way. And I think it was good for sending a message. Absolutely. Uh, can't having watched the guy play under Ray Rhodes, it 
it wasn't as if it, you know it wasn't going to get any uh, worse with with Brzezinski in there. So yeah, I mean uh, Doug Doug was a, a you know a, you know I think he was the either first or second guard taken, and um, you know was a huge huge recruit coming out of Boston College, and you know the problem was is uh, you know Doug had a certain skill set, and they wanted him to do something different than what his skill set was. I mean Doug was kind of a kind of a road grader, kind of a masher, and in the NFL. Uh, speed kills. I mean, it, it's not a very, you know, even though there's a lot of hard hits, you have to be able to be quick. And I think where Doug struggled a little bit is, uh, you know, he was used to a lot more downhill running, uh, a real smash mouth deal. And um, even though we played in, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, probably one of the toughest divisions in football in that NFC East, it, uh, you know, the guys were big and they were strong and, you know, you had to be able to, you know, do some things to be pretty creative. And, uh, you know, you can look back and say those, you know, Doug struggled a little bit, but then you also got to remember that there were some pretty impressive defense alignment playing in the NFC East at that time. I mean, the big one would have been um, Keith Hamilton up at the Giants was in his prime. And, uh, you know, to this day, people ask me who the best is. And I got to say, Keith Hamilton was probably better than any of them. So, oh, wow. so uh, you got to remember you got those um, like those big fatty brothers that were down in the Redskins with Dan Wilkerson and uh, Dana Stubblefield. I mean, there were a lot of – the NFC East was, was real stacked. So, you know, all of a sudden you throw Doug in, and what kind of hurt him a little is, you know, he had a big uh, a big matchup against Warren Sapp, and Warren Sapp was in his prime and threw that nasty kind of matrix move on him. And uh, after that, you know, Doug kind of went in the tank a little bit. It's a shame how that happens, but yeah. NFL stands for not for long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what the NFL is, right? Not for long. Yeah. Uh, Mac? You were injured during your first NFL game. What happened? Um, I had torn a piece of the the tendon in my knee, my patellar tendon, and, in training camp. And uh, I decided, you know, the doctors couldn't give me an accurate whether or not, hey, you, know, you need to have surgery or you should sit this one out or you're okay. And they kind of left the decision up to me. And so I went out and played. And I remember uh, Andre Wadsworth um, came underneath on an inside rip, and I planted my foot real hard in the ground, and it got kind of stuck in, or kind of, I stepped on the the seam in the veteran stadium. There was a kind of a about a, a seam of about four inches, and my foot got kind of ledged in there. And as he kind of ripped underneath, he hit me, and I, it was like somebody shot me from the fourth row in the knee, and my uh, patellar tendon ruptured. Oh wow. You yeah, have to go through that hard uh, hard rehab process. At the same time, they ask you to switch from right tackle to right guard. Two two part question. I mean, how much of a, a hard recovery was that? At the same time, having to switch positions in the NFL. Yeah, so um, I couldn't. I didn't get out of bed for three weeks. I couldn't bend my knee for three months, and uh, I pretty much rehabbed the whole off season in Philly. And trained my butt off, and um, I've got to say, it took me every single day up until training camp to get ready. And what was kind of nice was um, going to training camp. I think the Eagles had really discounted me. I mean, I think I was the I, I had started at right tackle, and I think they had me at the third string left tackle. And so I'm playing third string, and everything's kind of cruising along. And then all of a sudden, John Runyon uh, tears an intercostal and is out of practice. And they, um, the guy that they had as his backup was kind of struggling a little. So was they that, had me go and play second string right tackle. Uh, was the backup Brian Shaw at the time? Yeah, I think that was Brian Shaw. Okay. And okay. I was just after curious. about two practices, uh, they asked me to start. And then I played there um, the rest of training camp. And I remember I went into the Browns game. Uh, that was our, you know, the first game back, our first preseason game. And I think Courtney Brown was the guy on me. And I had a pretty solid game against him. And I think uh, it was pretty interesting. All these people wanted to interview me, and they were kind of, uh, you know, trying to get me to say something bad against John. And I remember being like, dude, the guy's huge, and he's a great player. Like, you know, uh, like, I'm a nobody in this thing. Like, the guy's worth a ton of money, and he's worth it. And I remember walking out and Tom Modrak being like, thank you. That could have gone really bad. I'm like, well, it's the truth. The guy's a hell of a player. Like, you know, believe me, I don't have an ego in this thing. And I think that was a, a smart move. And then when – we went back to training camp, you know, Doug was having some problems and all of a sudden they threw me in at left guard and uh, for a drill. And, you know, I think it was on a, in a nine on seven drill. And then from there on, I was just a starter for the next five years, four or five years. Absolutely. Um, I have one question. I have one more uh, team question that, that, that's uh, kind of a call favor with Eagle fans. 
were you there during the, I, I guess it was after the game, where Bill Johnson was, I guess, in the locker room just having a good old time after the Eagles had just lost, and I guess Andy Reid cut him right then and there. Were you in the locker room for that game? Yes. Do, do you mind sharing what happened? <clears throat> um, you know, kind of similar to George Hageman, uh, you know, okay. Bill Johnson was, um, you know, Big, big dude, uh, you know, played for in the league for a long time, was probably a seven, eight, nine, ten year vet, you know, uh, was pretty outspoken and had some problems and, you know, didn't really mesh too well. And I remember, uh, you know, after the game was, you know, like you said, was uh, pretty vocal and, you know, started wanting to point some fingers and, uh, you know, was pretty loud about it. I remember, uh, you know, Andy, I think, in not wanting to, you know, have the tides turn against him or, you know, wasn't going to have somebody call him out and decided, you know what, we don't need this guy around here. So cut him. Uh, you know, he's a vested veteran and said, hey, you know what, we're still going to pay you your money. We just don't want you around. We don't need you. And sent him on his way. So, I mean, I I think coming into a situation like Philadelphia, which had been in kind of, um, you know, Ray Rhodes era, had just been kind of a different team. I think Andy came in there with uh, an idea of, hey, this is, you know, the vision and culture I'm going to create. And there's certain guys on the team that, uh, you know, I inherited, but I don't have to stick it out with them. And as long as they can, you know, fit within my team environment, then, you know, I'll keep them. And if they can't, I'm going to get rid of them. For sure. Matt? Who were some of your favorite teammates during your Eagles years? Um, probably John Runyon was probably my best friend and still a good friend of mine. I still talk to him quite often. Uh, I would have to say, yeah, John, hands down. And um, Hank Fraley was a good friend and, uh, you know, Bubba Miller. Uh, Trey Thomas, of course, who I played next to for all those years. Um, you know, and I always really liked Jermaine Mayberry. Um, you know, Brandon Whiting was, uh, you know, a teammate of mine from college, and Brandon was on that team. So, uh, and I, you know, still talk to Hugh Douglas uh, quite often. So, you know, Hugh and I have always been good friends. So, uh, I still have a lot of really good friends from that team and um, have always, you know, o- always root for the Eagles when I see them on Sunday. Were you sad, you know, that the year that they traded you, I guess the year prior, the next year they get Terrell Owens, they go to the Super Bowl. You know, I, as somebody who was a part of that culture, a part of those NFC Championship games where they were just so close, whether it's pointing the finger they didn't run the ball enough or, or whatever, um, was it like a bittersweet thing where you're like, I'm so glad to see guys like Hugh Douglas, you know, get No, I wasn't happy in. for them at all. I was pissed. I was, uh, yeah, <laughs> are you kidding me? I, I would have loved to have been there. I was hoping they were going to lose. I mean, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a shitty way that I got traded. And, um, you know, yeah, I was unhappy. I mean, I got traded to a really good team and got to play with some of the best players that, that the NFL have ever seen. So I got, you know, I got traded from a great offensive line to, to probably one of the best offensive lines to ever play in football. But, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I put blood, sweat, and tears in and, you know, had a house and friends and had a great, you know, uh, a great experience and always loved Philadelphia. So, you know, I wasn't happy about getting traded. I mean, I was I was happy to see those guys get the opportunity to go. But, you know, secretly I was like, dude, if they win this thing, I'm going to be pissed. What exactly led to you being traded? Because at the time the Eagles offensive line was a strength and trading you, it felt like a guy who, like you, like you talked about earlier, you're versatile enough that you can play guard and tackle. It just seemed odd at the time. I don't think we ever really got a true answer from Andy Reid or, you know, Joe Banner or whoever as to why you were exactly traded. It was based on some contract stuff. There were some promises made, um, you know, be, uh, the, the previous year. On, um, you know, I, I played through some injuries and there were some, you know, some things that happened and, uh, you know, there were some promises made. And when, uh, you know, we went to in the off season to go, you know, talk about those promises, they were kind of empty promises. So um, at the time, I, I should have realized that, you know, the NFL is, uh, you know, that's just the NFL. And I think I, at the time, I, you know, had a little too much pride in me and I should have realized like, all right, well, you know, this machine's bigger than me and, you know, people get lied to every day. Uh, at the time I was like, you know what, uh, fuck that. And I, so I was like, you know what, if you're not going, if you're not going to honor what you said, then, you know, I like to get traded and we kind of battled back and forth. And then when things got toxic, I, I don't know how we could go back from where it went. And, um, you know, they traded me to, I, I, I didn't think I could go to a worse place, but I got traded to a worse place and I, I had to go, uh, Played for Carl Peterson, who was a way, way worse person than anybody I dealt with in Philadelphia. 
was Andy Reid a part of some of the promises, or was it more like Joe Banner? Because I guess nowadays, you know, after the fact, a lot of players have pointed the finger. Uh, I think Brian Dawkins is one. He doesn't really get into it too much, but he says a lot of it was Joe. It wasn't all Andy. Um, how much was it Reid, or, or or is it like a no comment thing? You don't want to you know, get into it. No, I mean, I, I always dealt with Andy. Um, you know, Andy and I always had a pretty good rapport. I always really liked playing with him, um, you know, and I – I, you know, if I could, if I could have gone back and could have talked to him, you know, the John of, you know, 2003, I would have explained it a little bit different. And I think if uh, Andy and I had not been so prideful, because I know years later he said the same thing, like that was a mistake. I should have never done it. We, we should have talked this thing out and figured out a better way for it. And uh, I agree. I mean, we should have, but you know, at the time, you know, the Eagles were pretty good. Uh, you know, Andy's, you know, was definitely flying high, and I would think I was you know, imagining I was a pretty good player and, you know, I think we just have a lot of, you know, egos and uh, that's what I'll chalk it up to. And it was good. You know, I mean, it, uh, it's funny. You always learn from some of your mistakes and I think it was a huge mistake for me to learn and, or it was a, it was a really crappy um, lesson for me to learn and I should have never left there. And, uh, you know, I should have uh, found a way to make it work, but, you know, I think I got some bad advice from my agent and, um, uh, you know, it definitely, I, you know, watching those games, I think that, you know, my ability to go in there and play and kind of lead that thing could have made that thing a little bit different. So it was tough to watch. As two diehard Eagle fans, myself and Matt, speaking for him, I, I, I know from talking to him back then, talking to him today, we both hated when you were traded. So, and I know a lot of Eagle fans were like, why would they trade John Wellborn? It was like, what? Like, are you kidding me? So, yeah, you know. no, I, I was pissed, man. I, um, dude, I had an awesome, I hear you. I, I had a lot of friends. I mean, dude, it was the team that I came up on like blood, sweat and tears. Like, man, I, dude, I almost ended my career in the vet and getting the chance to play in the link. And no, it was a great, I, I wish I could have played my entire career there. And, um, you know, unfortunately I got shipped out to the outpost known as uh, Kansas city and you guys played for Dick Vermeil and some really talented players, but in terms of an organization and a team, uh, you know, nothing really matched playing in Philly. Uh, Matt? Uh, what are some of your uh, favorite moments from your Chiefs era and your teammates at the time? Um, geez, I mean, I, it was cool. I got to go play with Tony Gonzalez. Uh, Tony and I went to college together, and so we reconnected, and that was pretty awesome. Uh, I got to play with Will Shields. So, you know, Will is probably, I view, probably the best guard to ever play the game. And uh, Willie Rofe. So I was, you know, pretty fortunate. And then I also got to play with Kyle Turley. And, um, you know, Kyle was always a really close friend of mine. So when he came to Kansas City, I got to play next to him. Uh, you know, I got to block for Priest Holmes and, um, you know, Larry Johnson when he was in his prime and was a, you know, force to be reckoned with. So I was really fortunate to play. And Jared Allen, you know, I, I you know, I remember when Jared Allen had some trouble. I was, you know, he lived with me for a year. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I was really fortunate to have some great relationships and some really, really solid friends come out of Kansas City. I just wish we could have won some more games and, you know, played in a better environment. And uh, it was, you know, definitely, uh, you know, I, I always kind of laugh and thought that the uh, Philadelphia training camp was bad until I went to Kansas City and realized that was worse. What was the uh, differences between the, between the uh, training camps? Uh, well, I mean, if you thought Andy Reid was bad, you, you gotta. Well, you, you guys have all seen the uh, uh, Dick Vermeil with the Vince Papali, you know, uh, Unbreakable. Oh, for sure. Or the uh, the the movie is about uh, with Mark Invincible. Wahlberg. Yeah. Dude, Dick Vermeil was insane. I mean, you know, we were on the field for you know two hours a day or uh, two practices a day for three hours. I mean, we were never out of pads. I mean, it was definitely. Uh, I always joke that like you know it was like Cree Fontaine was you know was uh, playing this stuff. He's like you know it's going to take a suicide pace and today's a good day to die was our motto every day. So, uh, you know, it was definitely a, um, you know, pretty rigorous deal, but, you know, just in terms of, of facilities, I mean, I always laugh. I mean, we were in the worst facilities in the Eagles and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, we get the Novacare center and Lincoln financial and we go to some, one of the best facilities and best deals in the NFL. And then all of a sudden I go back to something that was worse than what we had in, uh, in Philadelphia to begin with. Absolutely. Um, I guess, I guess the next question would have to be, what was it like being coached by Dick Vermeil? He's a legendary coach in the NFL having won a Super Bowl. Was there, you know, like, I guess you talked about culture, you know, 
was it a situation where you're you know going in there you thought the Chiefs were going to be a Super Bowl contender um obviously being in that division um you know comparing the divisions and uh comparing Reed and Vermeil did you think the Chiefs going there was a Super Bowl contender yeah well I mean they they had been a uh you know the number one offense in the NFL when I was in Kansas or when I was in Philadelphia so it was it was very cool to go to a, a team that I viewed as you know this is a team that we could you know, very well face the Eagles in the Super Bowl. And I think that was exciting because here was an opportunity to play on a great team and with a great group of players. And uh, oddly enough, it just never connected, you know. And, and um, you know, it was, it was really disheartening to have that many great players and not be able to win the big game. And, you know, I, I think a lot of that, and I was talking earlier about that kind of vision and culture, like going into the games and you know you're going to win the game. And I think that was something that we didn't really have in Kansas City, that there wasn't that, you know what, like, I don't know how it's going to happen, but we're going to win this game, you know, and there was no doubt in anybody's mind. It was almost like in Kansas City, people were waiting to lose. And, you know, I remember, like, see, like seeing that in guys and just being like, dude, you can't think like that. The this, this shit's got to end. And not really knowing why that was the way, you know, and I still don't really know why a certain team has that swagger and, like, what about it? Because, I mean, the Eagles had it, and then they lost it. And, uh, you know, you can watch, you know, completely different teams, and then Andy goes to, uh, you know, the Chiefs, and those guys seem, you know, are looking pretty good. I mean, you can watch NFL teams walk out on Sunday, and you can see the swagger, and you can see the confidence in teams, and, you know, it's just, it's always been very amazing, and I, I never could pinpoint it. I couldn't tell you what it is, but it's definitely something as a, a member of the team, you feel it and you know it. 100%. Um, Matt, I believe uh, you were going to ask about what, what exactly happened. Uh, I think one of the questions he was really curious was, what actually led to your release from the Kansas City Chiefs? Um, I think I was in the last year of my contract, and they wanted to uh, you know, go younger. And, you know, they were looking to do some things. And I remember they called up and they said, hey, we're not going to honor your last year of your contract. And I was like, okay, that's fine. It's my 10th year. And uh, that was the end of it. So, you know, I think I was scheduled to make more money than they thought I was worth. Truly a shame. Matt? You signed with the Patriots in August. Uh, Why didn't your stint last there longer? Uh, I got hurt in the last preseason game. So I got hurt in the last preseason game, and I didn't say anything. And I figured, you know what, there's no way I have never not made an NFL team. So I figured, you know what, I'll I'll make the team, and I'll worry about it down the line. And uh, they called me about one minute before 4 o'clock on the the final cut day and said, hey, we need to talk to you. And I went in there, and I talked to Belichick. And uh, he told me, he goes, hey, we got to cut you today. we got to make some roster moves. We're going to re-sign you tomorrow. And then when they – uh, cut me, a bunch of teams called, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to pass a physical. And so when they called me back and they brought me back in, I think they were surprised I didn't sign with somebody else. And so they, when they brought me back in, they had me go through the physical, and they found uh, that I was injured, and that was the end of it. What were some of the teams that were interested in signing you after the cut? Uh, I don't remember. You'd have to call my agent. I wasn't, at the time, I remember I wasn't too keen on going anywhere because I knew I wasn't going to pass any physicals. Just curious if the Eagles were going to wave the olive branch. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been nice. I would have gladly gone back there. I was, you know, I, I, yeah, it would have been a great opportunity. But at that point, you know, um, I, you know, and what's what's crazy is I was kind of, uh, you know, and then I, I basically came home and like three weeks later I had surgery on my knee. I had to clean out. I had a bone chip that had dislodged during the game. It got stuck in the joint. And so they cleaned out my knee and, I remember I was rehabbing to come back and teams were calling. And um, I remember just thinking like going out and training and thinking like, you know, my knee's not, uh, you know, where it needs to be. And I I just don't know if I'll be able to go out and do this 11th year. And I decided, you know, I was kind of going through this whole deal, training, trying to figure out like, Hey, I need this thing to respond better. And, uh, and then I got a phone call from Kyle Turley and he had had like a seizure at a bar and uh, they had taken him in and done a bunch of scans on his brain and found out he had all this brain damage. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, Ten years is good. I think I'm good with ten years. I'll stick it out with that. It's crazy. Um, I guess the league just settled a settled a lawsuit with former players. Um, what's your take on the whole uh, injuries in the game right now? You know, you know, you have uh, Dustin Keller. You know, getting getting you know basically blowing out his whole leg. You know, it seemed because of the, the 
the defender was trying not to hit the head. Um, what's your take on today's uh, safety rules and, I, and and that whole whole process that's going on? I think the NFL is a, a violent – or as I was told when I came in the league, the NFL is a violent game played by violent people doing violent things. And I think when you try to slow the game down and make players – adhere to some unnatural things, I think you're going to see some problems. Um, you know, like, I agree, training camp doesn't need to be as brutal as it was, but, uh, you know, that was also good in that when you went out for your first game, you weren't, you know, hitting wasn't new. Uh, I think I, I, I think it's, a, it's such a fast, explosive game that without a certain amount of prep work, I think it just can cause injuries. Um, you know, I... Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, as I'm watching the game today, I don't know how you could play the game with kind of this this idea in the back of your head, like I can do this, I can't do this, and it, it's just I don't know. It's um, uh, I think the reason that there was a huge lawsuit was that the NFL withheld information from the players. They knew that when I, you know, for example, when I came in the NFL, they, when they explained a concussion there, they told us the way, you know, you're going to get a concussion is if you're knocked unconscious. And oh, wow. it wasn't until, you know, 2007 when they came out and they redefined it. And they'd known that for years that a cushion is, you know, way different. And when they started talking about concussions, I was like, well, no, I've never been knocked out. And then when they redefine concussions, you're like, okay, I've had 10,000 concussions. And I think, you know, with the helmets and a lot of these things, like they knew a lot of this information and they withheld it. And I think that's what the players were pissed about. It's like, you know what? We're all adults here. Everybody, you know, nobody's going to make any grand illusions that somehow playing football is going to increase the longevity or increase the quality of your life uh, physically. But, you know, making a player aware of what's going on, you know, taking some precautions, um, you know, and maybe not, you know, trying to kill you in training camp. Uh, you know, might have paid some dividends and added some end on the back of a career and maybe not hurt so many people. But, you know, you got to remember, uh, the NFL is a business, and I think uh, they've done a great job of uh, convincing America and the rest of the world that it's not a business, that it's this kind of institution in America. And at the end of the day, man, the owners are in this. They, they wouldn't be doing this unless they were making, you know, truckloads of money. So, uh, you know, we're just a little, you know, dancing monkeys that make it happen. Absolutely. That that I think that's the the first time I've truly understood the player's perspective and what exactly was going on because you hear so many different stories from so many different so called experts and just yeah, I mean, hearing you tell me that. It's you know, it's funny. I, I always uh, I don't know if you guys read pro football talk, but I always click on the yeah. column on Twitter and I always read the comments and the and the people that post on Pro Football Talk are slightly maybe uh one brain cell more intelligent than the people that comment on YouTube videos, but it's always like, oh, these greedy players, they spend all their money, they're greedy, they're greedy. And I'm, and I'm always thinking to myself, like, like, these fucking people have no concept. I mean, you know, uh, and the NFL could have got rid of all of these problems if they had just given the players lifetime medical benefits. So instead of five years, they should have just said, hey, guys, uh, we're just going to give you lifetime medical benefits. They would not have had to put this fund together. They not, would not have had to deal with any of this shit. So it was just their own greed that basically brought this thing on. So, I mean, all they had to do was just give lifetime medical benefits, and all the players would have been like, great. You know, so the only thing the players were suing for was money because, dude, these medical bills are starting to, you know, climb up. Guys are having severe problems. They can't get insured because nobody wants to insure them. And these guys are like, dude, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to pay, you know, five, $6,000 a month to, you know, in medical insurance and they're not cutting pre-existing conditions. It's like, dude, if the, if the NFL just came through and said, hey, we're going to give you guys lifetime medical benefits – all the players would have stepped in line and been like, awesome, we don't have any problems. We're, we're cool that you lied to us, just take care of us. And I think that was the bigger issue is just the NFL being cheap. And, you know, you're not really talking about that many players either. I mean, I saw a statistic that Troy Vincent uh, gave me that was like in the last 20 years, or I think in the last 20 years, 15,000 guys have played in the NFL and less than 700 played longer than three years. So, I mean, you know, if you look at vested players, less than 1,000, I mean, that would have been easy. So I, I think what you're seeing is just a lot of players that were pissed off, like, dude, I don't have medical benefits. Uh, I have these pre-existing conditions, and uh, I'm not getting insurance. And, you know, I think that's what a big part of this lawsuit was about. And you know what? It's never fun to come out years later and find out that somebody withheld information from you. Multi, 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 many times over, billion-dollar NFL, you know, type thing. It, it, it's, it, 
it truly is crazy when you think about it oh. that they don't already take care of their players. Well, I mean, think, think about this. I mean, here here was my personal favorite. I remember um, sitting in the uh, the uh, the dining room at the Patriots facility eating uh, like after practice, and I remember you know I didn't have wife or kids or family or anybody, so I was kind of sitting there late. Like I remember I'd gone and lifted weights, and I was in there getting something to eat, and there was like about ten TVs on. And I was sitting in there with like two other rookies or other players. And I remember Bob Kraft walking in and turning off all of the TVs. That's just so disrespectful. Yeah, like we're watching the TVs. Or I remember uh, one of the rookie kids was up there and he, I remember he, had, he was like putting fruit in a bowl and Bob Kraft just walked over and said, oh, it looks good, and took the bowl and walked away. You know, that's like that's crazy. Yeah, wow. shit like that. Or you, you know, or my my personal favorite was uh, having to go to Jeffrey Lurie's house the day before the final cut, and then you show up to a barbecue, a party at his house. That's really a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a I, I guess you could say a carnival for his kid and all of their friends. And there were different booths for the Eagles to man. You know, so you're up in you know up on the blue line and. Uh, you know, here you are, you show up at the Lurie's house and there's a little kind of carnival barbecue for you to meet all their friends. And it's like, you know, I mean, make no illusions. I mean, we're very, I, you know, I get it. You know, I, I know the deal. You know, I, I know what you pay us for, but, you know, let's not make illusions. I mean, the guys that own these teams are rich, rich men and they got, uh, they've gotten this rich by not giving away their money. And, you know, I mean, they are who they are. So I think what they've done a great job of is uh, convincing the fans in the world that, you know, the players are stupid, greedy, uh, ignorant, dumb, you know, waste all their money on, you know, child support rims. And, you know, uh, three years after the NFL, they're all broke and they're all a bunch of deadbeats. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's perpetuated because it just, I don't know, it, it's a shitty thing. And, but, you know, it is the way that it is. You, uh, you spoke about the Jeffrey Laurie picnic, cookout, whatever you want to call it. Um, that still goes on today because there's, you know, every year it seems like an Eagles rookie or a player that was there for years that gets cut the day after that barbecue. They go on their Twitter and they're like, I just spent my whole freaking day to hit this barbecue. And, you know, and now I'm cut, you know, that's, that that's just really crazy how the owners don't respect the players like that. Well, you got to remember, dude, we are, um, we're just little cogs, you know, and, and what's interesting is, you know, uh, like you don't. You basically rent your jersey. They lease it to you. You, you lease a number, and, you know, I, I think, who was it I just saw? Uh, God, I just saw some player that was all pissed off that uh, they allowed a rookie to have his number, a guy who just retired. I just saw it on uh, Pro Football Talk, and, like, I was kind of laughing. I'm being like, dude, you know, there's, there, you know, before me there was a guy that wore 76 at the Eagles. There, you know, there will be people after. I mean, there's, you know, the day John Runyon left, so they gave 69 to somebody else. So, I mean, it's, you know, Donovan McNabb left. They gave somebody else Donovan's number. I mean, that's just the way the NFL works. It's like the NFL is a big, big machine, and it's a incredible job and probably the best job I've ever had in my life. And people ask me all the time, was you know, what was it like? And I tell them, I'm like, hands down, the most fun I've ever had at work. And uh, I loved every minute of it, you know, the you know all the bullshit. I look back on it, and I have nothing but positive to say. But, you know, I, I also don't candy coat it and make any illusions about what I did. I mean, I was there to do a job, and, um, you know, there's billions of dollars at stake. And, uh, you know, whether or not you win, lose, or draw, the owners still come out on top. You know, play, players win and die with losses. You know, the owners don't. You know, Kansas City didn't win games, and we still sold out every game, you know? For sure. Have you considered coaching? I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't heard that you're currently coaching. No, I, I was never um, – for me, I had a, a good skill set on what I could do. Um, I, I don't know if the way that I played the game, I could necessarily teach somebody to do it. And, uh, you know, I was happy when uh, football ended that, you know, I'll go and reinvent myself and do something else. Absolutely. Uh, Matt? Uh, John, tell us about your website. Tell all our fans out there that haven't heard of it. So uh, when I got injured. I was sitting on the couch uh, doing some rehab and I got a phone call from CrossFit.com and at the time CrossFit was relatively underground and unknown. Uh, now they're, you know, media explosion and everybody's heard of CrossFit but they asked me to uh, put up a website called CrossFit Football based on my training and then teach one of their specialty seminars. So CrossFit has 
uh, is a, you know, a company and they can certify people in their CrossFit method. And then they asked me to develop a sports specific style of CrossFit. And so we called it CrossFit football because I played CrossFit or because I played football. And so uh, we basically, for the last four years, have traveled the world educating people in, um, you know, how to basically coach athletes, create bigger, stronger athletes uh, using a CrossFit, similar CrossFit method. So we uh, we started that in 2009, and I started a food company about a year later to support it called Well Food Company, and uh, named after myself, Wellborn. And, uh, you know, it was basically kind of grew out of this deal as I was traveling a ton. And even when I was on the road playing, I could never get things that I really wanted to eat. And so we started kind of designing uh, foods and treats and stuff where it was easy to, for athletes to kind of travel and snack. And so it's all based on kind of a paleolithic diet and some simple basic stuff. So we started doing that. And um, yeah, the funniest one is I started a blog a couple of years ago called Talk to Me Johnny. And I started answering training questions and questions on life. And it's pretty funny. I'll put up a post and we'll get, you know, 45 to 75,000 hits in 24 hours on people. And so if you guys check it out, you can go uh, look at that. And, um, you know, so it, it's been pretty good. I mean, I was I was really pretty amazed when uh, I retired from the NFL and got contacted by CrossFit because I didn't really realize that there was a huge cross-section of people that were so interested in this stuff. I thought that, you know, what I did as a professional athlete to be successful was kind of unique to just that market. But it's been really cool that the CrossFit community so embraced us and uh, really wants to get better. And so we're really excited to work with them. Absolutely. Um, I don't believe I got a chance to ask you, um, coaching, uh, having Bill Belichick coach you being a part of, you know, the Patriot culture, Tom Brady, you know, the whole thing. Um, what was it like being a Patriot? Um, one of our resident, uh, employees here on the website, Anthony Pyrus, got to ask you because he's a big, big time Patriot fan. Uh, what was it like? Um, you did tell us about our upper craft a little bit. Uh, what, what was the Patriot experience like, even though it was so short lived? Yeah. Uh, what I appreciated about the, Bill Belichick and the Patriots was it was all business. Uh, Bill Belichick was all business. Um, there was, you know, it didn't seem personal. Um, I, I maybe didn't get to know him. I didn't really get that, that vibe from him, but it was like, hey, this is what I need you to do. Uh, you know, he was real big on, you know, if, uh, if, if a guy had played in the Patriots organization and had proved himself, he was pretty loyal to those guys. And I remember coming into the situation and thinking, man, I really would have loved to have played here uh, earlier in my career. And, um, you know, I really liked the city of Boston. I always liked the vibe. I mean, we went to the games. I mean, the fans were, were, you know, great fans and, uh, you know, playing with Tom Brady. And, you know, the thing that I've always appreciated about the Patriots is it doesn't matter who the players are. Like they always find a way to win. I mean, I, I thought the, you know, the defensive scheme was great. Uh, you know, I really liked their scheme on offense, and I thought that, uh, you know, if I could have got the opportunity to play there, I thought I could have been very, very successful, but it didn't happen. What was your favorite team to play for, the Eagles or Chiefs? Uh, probably the Eagles. Hands down, the Eagles. Tonight, obviously the Eagles are going to be playing in a couple hours. Donovan McNabb will be in the house. We'll have his jersey number retired. He's going to retire, being honored by Brian Dawkins and a host of former Eagles that he played with over the years. Um, first question, obviously Andy Reid being in the house, will you be watching the game? And um, are you uh, happy for Donovan? And were you invited to the game? Uh, I was not invited to the game, um, but I will click it on and watch it here. And I will uh, be more than happy to see Donovan get his jersey retired. And I'll be happy to see a bunch of Eagles uh you know, stand up and, you know, cheer for him. And I think it'll be a great game. I'm, I'm super excited to watch Andy's, Andy's return to uh, Philadelphia. And, dude, I'm like you guys, man. I'm, uh, I'm just a fan now, so I'm excited to see the good games. Do you have a take on Chip Kelly's fa uh, fast take offense? Would you have liked to play in it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's an exciting offense. Um, I think where he's going to run into dividends is uh, keeping his quarterback healthy. Uh, a lot of the, you know, I, I think what's going to happen is historically, um, you know, the team that does the best is the one that can keep their quarterback upright the most. And, uh, you know, you're putting your quarterback in a really vulnerable position and they don't seem to, you know, the goal isn't necessarily protecting the quarterback as well as it should. And I think it's pretty fast paced and uh, it's exciting to watch and they run a ton of plays. 
But um, as, as long as they can keep their quarterback healthy and their first and second guy, I think they're going to be okay. Unfortunately, Michael Vick has a history of not staying healthy. Sure. And um, I think if, you know, all of a sudden they get down to a point where Vick gets hurt and the backup gets hurt and they're in their third string guy, I think uh, things are going to be tough. Um, you know, uh, every year somebody comes to the NFL that's going to rewrite the book and they end up being just another chapter. And I think uh, Chip Kelly's got some great ideas. Um, I, I really like the coaching staff he's put together. I mean, there's a lot of ex-Eagle coaches that he brought back. I mean, there's, you know, Trey Thomas, Deuce Staley. I mean, uh, I'm excited to see all those guys as coaches. Uh, I just hope his scheme um, can – survive and he can keep the quarterback healthy because without a, a good quarterback, I mean, you guys have seen it, you know, things just go downhill. Absolutely. Would you uh, say that you're back in the Eagle family good graces now, you know, years and years and years have passed. Uh, we've seen other ex-Eagles get back there uh, just recently, McNabb and Dawkins and Trotter and Hugh Douglas. And uh, I believe a couple of years ago, Bobby Taylor was, was at the Novacare complex. Um, are you back on good terms, or is it just one of those things? Time's gone. I don't need to go back there to be, you know, back in their good graces. Uh, I, I live in California, so I don't really have a ton of opportunity to get back there. But I definitely got to think that if uh, I was in the area, I would hands down uh, swing back there and say hello. For sure. I got to tell you, this has been one hell of an interview. It's gone well over an hour. We we planned on maybe 25 minutes. Yeah. And you, you, been, you, you were like, uh, hey, that was 20 minutes. And I'm like, uh, anybody that knows me knows that uh, 20 minutes is not going to, you know, nearly be enough for me to get it all out. It, it, this has truly been amazing. Um, my last question for you, and this will wrap us up. Have you thought about doing any broadcasting? Because, I mean, you definitely have, have the gift. Um, You know what? Uh, I wouldn't mind doing some broadcasting. I mean, I, I definitely have to get into it and, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, do a lot of groundwork and there's a lot of kind of busting your chops to kind of uh, get into it. I, I could think if I got a great opportunity, I definitely would do it. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate in that what I get to do uh, almost every weekend is I get to travel the world and I get to go meet people and educate them and I get to, you know, get up and speak and uh, really work with, you know, anywhere from, you know, 30 to 40 to 50 coaches every weekend and, you know, like, uh, I think, you know, next week we're in Nuremberg, Germany, and then, you know, three weeks later I'm in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. And, you know, I've been fortunate over the last four years to, to really travel and speak and, and uh, you know, convey my message on, you know, training nutrition and recovery. And I think, you know, through the blog and a lot of the stuff we're doing, working on our, I'm working on a book, has been, uh, you know, hugely rewarding. So if I ever got the opportunity to go back and, you know, be a, be a cast, you know, sports caster, work for the NFL network and, um, you know, evaluate games and really talk about it, I think I would uh, be really excited to do it. I mean, I, I, I'm like a fan. I still watch the NFL network and I, I was watching Sean O'Hare up there and I was kind of laughing just because I knew him as a player and now he's up there in a suit and, uh, you know, or I, you know, I played against Michael Strahan for years and, you know, know Stray really well and to see him on TV with, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Kelly Ripa is, is awesome. So, uh, you know, if, if the opportunity presented itself, but, you know, I'm pretty fortunate. Um, I got a great wife and I, I got two twin daughters that are two years old. And, you know, the job that I have now affords me to spend a lot of time with them. And so, you know, if I could do something that allowed me to, to really spend some time with my family and do something rewarding, I'd do it. Absolutely. Um, last question I have. Uh, I know that was the last question, but this is the last one. You know, is there anything you'd like to say to your fans out there? Um, <laughs> probably the first time I'm um, uh, stumped for words. I mean, uh, we stumped you. <laughs> you yeah, you stumped me. Um, you know, I think uh, the NFL was a great experience. I loved to play. Uh, it gave me, a, you know, opened up doors and opportunities that I never could have dreamed of, and. I think uh, as a retired player, and a, you know, you, you kind of look back on your time and, you know, did I do the things that I need to prepare myself and move on in the future and, you know, and look at that as, hey, this was something I did in my life. Um, I think a lot of guys have real trouble letting go and they're always going to try to cachet and kind of, uh, you know, live on what they did in the past. And I always kind of looked at it like I want to kind of evolve and grow and, you know, almost a, that renaissance man where it's like I want to, you know, redefine myself and become a new person and, uh, you know, look at what I did in the past and say, hey, this was a great opportunity. I learned a lot, but this is what I'm doing going future. So um, I'm just excited to, you know, 
be able to go out in the future and see what else I got, what what's out store for me. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely. So I'm just going to wrap this up. So once again, I want to thank you. This has truly been awesome. We've interviewed pro wrestlers. We've interviewed authors. But this is our first uh, NFL player. And uh, i I got to say, we definitely picked the best one to start with. Well, thank so you. I, thank I, you very much. Absolutely. So for John Wellborn, the Big Mac, Mac Caruso, I'm Matt the Hitman Hoover. This has been your Pro Football Fix here on ProSportsFix.com. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks.